important part of being safe in the event of severe weather is being prepared. At Ameren, Illinois, we're prepared too. Prepared to restore power quickly and safely and to inform you of local outages and updates on restoration times with text alerts sent right to your phone. Sign up for outage notifications today. And check one more thing off your list at AmerinIllinois.com slash alerts. And hello again, everybody. It is time for the Keith Costas podcast starring our friend Keith Costas, MLB Network Analyst. I'm Bob Ramsey and glad you're with us. And Keith, how are you? Um, We missed a week. Um, We couldn't get our schedules together. How have you been the last couple of weeks? Yeah, all good. I mean, sorry to miss you last week, but I guess that's a good thing. It means baseball season's ramping up, a lot of stuff on the plate, and uh, things are actually getting going now, not just this 60-game preview we had last year. We actually get to play beyond 60, so it's a good thing, I guess. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. So many people talk about the quarter pole, but that that Memorial Day, third of the way through, I think teams really start to get a feel for who they are, who they're not, what they need. We'll get into that in a minute. And then our good friend, Mike Claiborne, always, and I mean, I'm talking about decades, has always said Flag Day is the day where he says he can decide who's real and and who's not. So we're now past that third way mark, and um, uh, teams are digging in for the summer. And what a way to start off our so-called summer that we just established than going with the Red Sox and the Yankees on MLB. Yeah, it's funny how quickly things kind of feel real when you get to this point in the season. You know, you're talking in mid-May and especially at MLB Network trying to give fans a national perspective and you try to make some sense of what you've seen so far. But you always know in the back of your mind it's a long season and a small sample size. But you're right. You get to that Memorial Day or Flag Day, as Clay says, and all of a sudden what two weeks ago seemed like maybe a fool's errand is all of a sudden set in stone. (laughs) And it does always tend to work out that way that people start to take things seriously right around this time. But yeah, you mentioned it, Red Sox Yankees tonight on MLB Network. It's actually the first time that they've played all season, which is just kind of a funny scheduling quirk. It's the latest in the season that that's happened since I think 96 was the last time they went this long without playing. But the thing that's really interesting, you know, talking about the shortened season is going to be having fans back in the stands in the Bronx tonight. The Red Sox obviously have been one of the better teams in the league this year. They were terrible last year they lost nine to ten against the Yankees they've actually lost 11 in a row in the Bronx they're one loss away from matching the longest losing streak they've ever had at Yankee Stadium so they're definitely anxious to get back in the win column and it should be a pretty good series just two completely different approaches they're not that far separated in the win column but you look at these teams offensively and it ties into a lot of the things that we've talked about the Red Sox Alex Cora back in the mix, and they are one of the most aggressive teams in the league. I think only Mike Matheny's Royals have swung at a higher percentage of pitches than Hmm. the Red Sox, and they have the 29th most walks in the league. And Remember, we've talked about this kind of on-base sabermetric approach and how to balance that with the more old-school fundamental baseball, and the Red Sox are kind of proof that you don't have to see a million pitches. The Yankees are way at the top of the list in terms of pitches seen. They draw a bunch of walks, but they're averaging less than four runs per game for the first time, and almost 30 years. So different ways to skin a cat. And uh, these teams definitely have different approaches. So it should be a fun series. Let's talk about the different approaches and talk about the Red Sox who were horrible in your analysis. What are the things that the Red Sox did or are doing to change who they are and change that perception of uh, the Red Sox? They've got some work to do to be among the best in, in baseball. Yeah, well, I think one of the things, and we touched on this at the beginning of the season, too, is having video back in play for a guy like J.D. Martinez. That's gotten a lot of run, and he's been very good this year. But I think the thing that people – yeah, he's been great. He's just been great. But I think the thing people overlook about last season is it wasn't just – you know the uncertainty of the schedule and adjusting to life in a pandemic – these guys weren't able to be at the ballpark as much as they were. And a guy like J.D. Martinez that spends a lot of time in the cage, when you can't be at the ballpark at noon for a 7 o'clock game, you know, some guys like to get there at 3, 4 o'clock. You know, I'm sure there's some guys that might like to show up at 6 o'clock on occasion for a 7 o'clock game. But a guy like Martinez that spends a ton of time at the park and just had that taken away from him last season, his whole routine is just completely thrown off. So I've heard a couple interviews with him where he basically has said that last year is just, you know, throw it out the window. He's not even thinking anything of it. And back to getting into his routine of the kind of player that he's been, obviously the results have been fantastic, but for the team at large, 
I don't think you can underestimate the Alex Cora factor. And obviously it's hard to quantify a manager's effect, but right. so many of these young players thrived under him as their manager during his first stint with the Red Sox. And they had okay seasons last year, you know, guys like Bogarts and especially Raphael Devers. But yes. this year Devers is right back to being that guy he was when they won the World Series. And in 19, when he led the American League in extra base hits, he's leading the majors in extra base hits again. So I just think that the familiarity with Cora, and it's nothing against Ron Renneke, who I think is a really good baseball guy. He had a long relationship with Cora going back to Cora's time as a minor league player. So it wasn't like it was some gigantic change in culture. But, you know, given the pandemic and all of the kind of uncertainty around the makeup of the leadership of the team going into the season, it was just a weird year for the Red Sox. And I think kind of resetting in that kind of, you know, throw it away like J.D. talked about applies to the whole team and getting a fresh start with Alex back in the mix Hard to argue with the results. So um, if you're one of those Red Sox fans that walk around with the sword of Damocles hanging over their head, what would you tell them to look out for? Red Sox are doing great. Martinez, Dev, they're doing great. But if there was a but that the Red Sox should pay attention to, what would it be? Well, I think it's just those scheduling quirks we talked about with this being the first time they've met the Yankees. It kind of applies yeah. to their schedule at large. They've only played 18 games in the division and more than half of them have been against the Orioles, who are obviously in a complete rebuild and one of the most hapless teams in the league right now. So they have a lot of games left on their plate, obviously 19 with the Yankees, but still close to 30 games with the Blue Jays and the Rays. And it might not be quite what the NL West is, but that's a pretty competitive and crowded division right now. So they haven't really been tested against their immediate competition within that division and just in terms of the games played on their schedule, they've got 17 and 17 days coming up right now. You know, just like yeah. what we talked about with Flag Day and Memorial Day, it starts to get real when you get in your division and the days get long and the schedule gets long. So, you know, it's hard to predict a downturn, but they're facing some challenges they haven't really had to confront yet here in the next couple of weeks. Speaking of confronting challenges, let's let's move to the other dugout for tonight's MLB game and talk about um, talk about the Yankees. Sometimes the injuries they've dealt with really over a period of time, not just this year. I'm surprised they contend at all, yet they still do. They can't get everybody healthy. Yeah, I mean, you look at the big guys in their lineup. It's been talked about ad nauseum, but obviously they went out and made the big acquisition for Stanton, who could have been a Cardinal, as we all know. And they've only had Judge and Stanton on the field together in about 40% of their game since they've been teammates. Obviously not what they envisioned when they got right. those two kind of cornerstones in the outfield. So that alone at the top end of the payroll, not being there as often as they would like is tough to deal with. But, you know, we talked about Luke Voigt the other week. They are really, really missing Luke Voigt right now. I think they have the lowest, if not, if not the lowest, the second lowest OPS from their first baseman in the majors this year. And Voigt obviously led the majors in home runs last year. So, you know, it's still kind of hard to believe for Cardinal fans. I think that Luke Voigt is the missing piece that stirs the drink in New York, apparently, but that certainly seems to be part of their problem. Center field, the same thing. Aaron Hicks is out for the season. They're way down mm -hmm. on the production list in center field. But Rammer, this is offense. It's almost hard to believe they're 0 and 15 when they give up five or more runs. And oh, they've my. given up, I know, right? They've given up four or more, more than, or four or fewer, more than any team in the league. But if they get past that five runs allowed, Mark, they just don't have the offense, which is just, it's so hard to fathom given the profile that the Yankees have had over the last couple of years and really over the majority of their history that they can't keep up in these slugfests. And it's not like they're close. 14 of the 15 games have been decided by three or more runs. So it's not like wow. these are 11, 10 games or extra inning slugfests that drag on and on. They're just getting blown out. I mean, you saw it yesterday. They lost nine to Ryan Yarborough for the Rays. There was a complete game, first complete game by a visitor in the Bronx since 2016. That was Chris Sale. And I think the Rays had gone something like 800 games between complete games. I mean, we know how the Rays operate. They're not That's trying to number. let their start. Right. They're not trying to let their starters go the distance. That's not how they operate at all. But Yarborough just cruised right through that Yankee lineup. And again, going back to what we talked about, fundamentals, kind of the difference between playing for the three-run homer and playing more of an old-school style, they are – an atrocious base running team. I mean, just, just awful. They're dead last in just about every category you can think of. They've made the most outs on the bases. They've grounded into the most double plays. They don't steal bases. They don't attempt to steal bases. Like they've grounded into nine double plays with the bases loaded this oh. year. <laughs> I mean, that is just a killer. You you know, obviously that's not all base running. That's more of an offense. That's more of a hitting statistic, but still you get runners on base and they just can't, 
string hits together. They play for the three run homer and they're not hitting home runs. So they've got a major problem on their hands and a stat that we looked at this week. It's so basic that I've never even considered to look it up and you don't really ever see it cited. It's just simply percentage of runners that reach base that score, not what you hit with risk, not on yep. third with less than two outs. Just when you get on base, how much do you score? Red Sox, 35% first of the majors, Yankees, 25% last in the majors. It kind of tells you all you need to know. Wow. So, um, let's move to the Yankees. The sky is falling department and are, are, are folks in New York feeling that because you say, okay, we're not scoring. We got a pitch. And then the race gets blown up in that same game, uh, against Tampa. Does that make everybody, uh, like I say, look out, the sky's falling. Yeah, there's definitely a little bit of panic in the air. It's not dissimilar from the Cardinals with some of the injuries that they're dealing with. You know, this game right. that we're going to have on MLB Network tonight was supposed to be Corey Kluber's spot in the rotation, who, you know, got off to a shaky start, obviously, through the no-hitter. But his last five, six, seven starts, he looked like the Corey Kluber of old. It looked like the Yankees had struck gold on a pretty high-risk, high-reward type of deal. But yeah, the risk, the risk popped up, and now he's sidelined for a pretty extended time with a shoulder injury, which is obviously troubling considering how little he's been able to stay on the mound the last couple of years. So the Yankees have some major questions um, in that division. You know, I was, I was skeptical. Certainly no one saw the Red Sox coming, but I was skeptical of Toronto. I knew they'd hit, but I didn't know if they would be, you know, really a contender in that division, but their offense is just so powerful that I don't think mm -hmm. you can rule them out. And with the Yankees not hitting, I mean, I think it's, I don't know if it's panic time, but it's certainly concern time in the Bronx. And you know, that's going to be magnified to a ridiculous degree in New York and people are always going to lose their minds and go nuts over everything. So yeah, it's certainly some panic in the air and the Yankees and Mets have, uh, it was supposed to be battling for relevancy this year and who was going to be, you know, it could, we have a subway series on our hands. Are these going to be two of the three or four best teams in the majors? And instead it's been sort of all drama on the back pages up here. Exactly. Um, you mentioned the Cardinals and injuries, and I want to mention them, not to focus necessarily on the Cardinals, but they could be uh, a prime example of what may be happening in the next six, seven weeks. That is the Cardinals with key injuries, 40% of their presumptive starting rotation down. Um, uh, one, their starting center fielder down. Their starting shortstop down. These are all key players. And like I say, they're not the only team facing this. Do, do you see first for them and then secondly in baseball, any kind of predictions yet on what kind of player movement between organizations we might be seeing? Well, I think I know Mo talked the other day about how they can't wait till the deadline. Not that they're necessarily going to make a move imminently or anything, but teams yeah. have to start doing their due diligence now. And if there's a deal to be made, you know, I think teams would be eager to pull the trigger and get some help in the short term, um, given all the injuries around baseball. But I think it's kind of, it's kind of a catch-22. The Cardinals, like we've talked about, aren't the only team in this position. It's not like there's only a handful of teams that would be interested in a back-end starter who might be available or, available. or maybe some of these guys that haven't signed that are veterans that are still out there that could theoretically ramp up in a relatively short time period and join a team. So, it's hard to really predict what they're going to do in the short term. I know Mo shot it down and I totally understand why he would, but I think the biggest question from a fan perspective and really the most fun thing to think about is when are we going to see Libertor and maybe Zach Thompson? I mean, I totally get why you don't want to rush those guys into a situation where you need them. That's not how you want to start your top prospects career, right. kind of throwing them, throwing them into the mix with their back against the wall. But it's hard to predict how the market's going to play out. And they've got two pretty intriguing prospects that are pretty close to major league ready in their system. So I'm interested to see when they get those guys up. If not, I guess we'll have to wait and see till the trade deadline. And everyone's going to talk about Scherzer, obviously. And I think that there's a decent chance he gets moved, but once you get beyond guys like Scherzer, you know, Trevor story on the position player side, that's sort of an obvious candidate to get moved. It's, it's hard to separate the next guys from the guys that are, you know, 10, 15 spots down the list. You could jumble them all up. And some guys might like, you know, you look at these lists, guys like John Gray towards the top or another, you know, talk Scherzer, or another Mizzou guy, Kyle Gibson's had a pretty good run. Yes. Um, we kicked around Jay Happ, who's kind of an under the radar guy. The twins are dead in the water and Happ, his numbers on the surface aren't great, but he's gotten blown up by the White Sox a couple of times who just destroy left-handed pitching. You take those two starts out, which I know is sort of a convenient non-reality way of looking at things, but you take those out and he's been a pretty serviceable starter for the, for the twins this year. Um, so that's kind of an intriguing name to me, but obviously 
a lot of the names that are available, the problem is they've never really pitched in meaningful games. And I mean, I'm not in these guys' heads. I don't know who has the moxie or that it factor to pitch in, in clutch games or whatever. But I mean, you look at some of the more intriguing names, guys like we mentioned, John Gray or Matthew Boyd in Detroit. These guys have never really pitched in meaningful games in their career. So could they help the rotation? Sure, they could probably help lots of teams' rotation. But you really don't have a great feel for how they're going to respond down the stretch in a pennant race. So it's kind of the great unknown, I think, is how this market's going to play out. And there's still a lot of baseball to be played. Maybe teams fall off and more sellers become available. But, yeah, yeah kind of hard to figure exactly what type of player the Cardinals would target right now. You know, and, and I still believe the Cardinals need a bat, and I know a lot of other teams do too. Any, and you mentioned the Twins. Anybody, any of the veterans on teams that maybe, to use your term, that are dead in the water that you think could be likely candidates to move along? You know, it's tough to find a match positionally for the Cardinals. Right. I feel like there might be some corner infielders available, but obviously the Cardinals are set just about every day at those you know, spots. Guy, I like, pardon the interruption. You know, a guy no, go I, for like, it. I think would fit would be David Peralta. Oh, that's a great call. I love David Peralta. He's been one of my favorite players for a long Left time. Hand. I know you meant, yeah, yeah. Former Cardinal, get him back in the mix and uh, actually let him hit this time instead of just pitch, I guess. Um, <laughs> oh, but yeah, yeah Peralta. Yeah, Peralta would definitely be a good candidate, and dead in the water would certainly describe the Diamondbacks for sure. So one once more uh, tonight, it's the Red Sox and the Yankees, the first of a few, I guess, MLB Network will have uh, this year because that is, no matter where you are, if you're a baseball fan, that is the marquee matchup. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I looked at my schedule these first couple months, and I was like, we're getting away from Red Sox-Yankees, huh? We're really mixing it up, but... I guess this explains it. They haven't played yet. So now that they're going to start playing, we'll have them just about every time they're together. Game, game will be on Fox on Saturday, ESPN on Sunday. So yeah, Yankees, Red Sox, you'll always be able to find it all over the country. That's great. Keith, great talking to you. We'll visit next week. We'll see if um, see if um, uh, the, the movement waters are churning a little bit by next week. We'll talk about that. It will be closer to Flag Day. Brought to, uh, as always, we're brought to you by Royal Banks of Missouri. Keith, have a great weekend, and we'll talk to you soon. You too, Rammer. Thanks.